Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold. And how, how do we do when it comes to bringing our sins to God? I have the chance to talk to uh, Scott Hubbard, who is not only a regular guest, but he is the managing editor for Desiring God. He's a pastor at All People's Church and a graduate of Bethlehem College and Seminary. Always uh, happy to find out his perspective. You can go to desiringgod.org to see all of his amazing writing he is a wonderful communicator. Scott, so nice to see you once again. It's good to be here, Bill. Yeah. You know, my very first verse I ever memorized, I think it was in seventh grade, and it was First John 1, 9. Ah. If we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Yeah. That, to me, was the most joyful thing I'd ever heard because I can take my sins to God, confess them, and he will forgive them. Yeah. Yeah, that's a precious verse. Oh, yeah. So that's my seventh grade brain, and it hasn't changed since. <laughs> that's great. That's the place to live. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. I don't I don't need any uh any more convincing that that verse said it all when yeah. it came to my moment. Yeah, there's of so much packed salvation. into that one verse. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I know we're going to talk about uh confessing our sins and and how we are how Christians fall you say into a couple of different categories. Yes, that's right. And maybe some Christians in different times of their life might see themselves in both categories. But one of the categories is is non-confessors. Those are Christians who don't often, perhaps only rarely, come to God and name a specific sin that they are confessing. So mm. there might be this theological idea that if Jesus has already covered it all, if I'm already forgiven for everything, you know, past, present, future, why do I need to keep bringing specific sins to God? Or maybe it's more practical, just people don't make the time to actually do it but they they rarely just sit down and with simple blunt honesty say i have blank you know confess something to god i have gossiped i have lusted i have overeaten i have fumed in sure. impatience will you forgive me so so there's one group uh the other group is just on the opposite end of the spectrum they're repeat confessors they come to god with the same sin with the same moment that they're remembering in their minds and oh. ask for forgiveness more than once, you know, maybe three, four, or five times. Again, they feel this sense of conviction that drives them to God, but once they've asked for forgiveness, once they've confessed it, they still they still feel unforgiven. And so they, they keep, maybe I need to do it again. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. So the yeah, opposite ends of the spectrum there. Is it because they repeat the behavior? Well, that is another category. That's not quite the person I have in mind. I'm thinking of someone okay. who has the same the same exact moment. So, you know, oh, okay. something happens at 2 o'clock today. They keep going back to 2 o'clock today. You know, and maybe it's days from now, and okay. they're still returning to that that moment. So that's a different different topic of people who keep committing the same sin. But I'm more thinking of someone who just, they carry on a guilty conscience, even though they've already come to God and, and, and forget. And so they just keep doing it. Yeah, but but because we're so relational with God, and if you, your wife says to you, um, Scott, would you take out the garbage? And you don't, and you wake up the next day, and you and you think, oh, I forgot to take out the garbage. Yeah. So so you say, sweetheart, I'm sorry, I forgot to take out the garbage. Right. Yep. She loves you either way. Yep. But you're finding a need to ask for forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. That's Be- right. Because it's relational, right? That's right. And yeah. so the the two. That's a good analogy. You know, the two poles would then be. Some, you know, the guy, the husband who, who doesn't actually ask for forgiveness, mm-hmm. doesn't vocalize that. Mm-hmm. Or on the other side, he's asked, she said, oh, of course, I forgive you. And then an hour later, he comes back and says, yeah, I just keep thinking about that. I didn't take out the guard. Will you forgive me? I, you know, I just yeah. need to ask again. Will you forgive me? And then keeps, <laughs> he just does that throughout the time. <laughs> so I know yeah. this isn't everybody. I right. find myself more in that second category of I just have this conscience that is, oh, it's, I'm still I'm still rolling in what I did. And so I need to go back. Yeah. The big question is, Scott Hubbard, do you take out the garbage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I usually good. do. My wife does too, but I... Uh, okay, yeah, good. It's good. Yeah. All right. So we're talking about non-confessors, and these are people who rarely confess specific sins to God. What is your counsel? Should we be 
confessing specific sins. Yeah, often. Thank I don't. You. I, I agree. I, I don't think that it's, uh, you know, you can get into a kind of paralyzed place here where if you think, oh, I need to confess every single sin that I ever commit. I mean, we commit sin. If you want to just get granular into our own into our own hearts, there are momentary sins that are like you know in in the midst of a. I'm not saying that we need to uh, you know hunt through our days and remember every minute and think, oh, did I sin? I need to forget. But instead, there are these sins that, like you said just a moment ago, Bill, they hinder fellowship, mm-hmm. they hinder communion, they they remain with our consciences after they've happened. And in in any relationship where there's broken communion, there needs to be uh, repair. And that happens through confession. And that's the same in our relationship with God. So, yes, I think we should often be confessing specific sins to God. Scott, would we be asking the Holy Spirit to bring to our mind as we're in prayer and, and study to let me know where I have fallen short? And the Holy Spirit would say, yeah, you weren't very nice today to that person at the store yeah and i thought you were kind of rude and you'd go oh i need to confess that sin i think that's a great way to do it you know david says search me oh god and know my heart try me and know my thoughts mm -hmm. so he's asking for god to reveal those things about himself but but you were saying you don't have to go through and micromanage every moment of your day because that would be exhausting yeah so maybe you could say the holy spirit lead me into a place where i'm aware of where i have fallen short that's right i think there are a couple ways to do it there's one we're gonna see in the psalm that this article is about that sometimes the lord presses his hand upon us so that we can't avoid it we're just going to deal he's going to move us toward confession and make us feel uneasy until we do but then yeah there are those other things we can do one really helpful thing that i've found uh, this was counsel from somebody else at the end of a day i don't do this every night but when i do it's often fruitful just go back and think what's one thing i did or didn't do today that reminds me of a need my need for a savior huh. and that usually brings up something that oh i i did that like i was i was really impatient with my boys or i was uh i entertained a pretty pretty twisted thought there or i'm dealing i'm carrying some bitterness and it's something that i hadn't confessed yet something i hadn't dealt with yet and so that can be a good what about what about if you've carried a a bitterness for 20 or 30 years (laughs) i mean that's yeah that's serious surgery then isn't it that is serious surgery that's more than a momentary i uh, i I would agree maybe uh, even some counseling yeah that's right scott Hubbard, let's talk about psalm 32 i have a feeling that's one of the places you're going to go yeah that's i love psalm 32 yeah such a uh offers such a map for confessing our sins and for bringing, bringing to God what we need to bring to him and then responding afterward in the ways that he expects us to respond. It speaks to both non-confessors and repeat confessors. To non-confessors, it's this call that says, no, you, God, God expects you to come to him, and sometimes he will put his heavy hand upon you until you do because he cares that much about restoring communion with you. And to the others, it says, you can confess one time a sin that you do. You know, we're talking again about that specific moment. You don't need to keep rehearsing the specific moment, bringing it back again and again. You can confess one time and listen for God, the shout of God's forgiveness. So Psalm 32 is a wonderful paradigm for confessing our sins. Mm -hmm. Let's continue talking about Psalm 32 uh, because there are places in, in Scripture that God specifically calls out specific sins. You were talking about people who will not inherit the kingdom of god Hmm. how about those for specific sins yeah (laughs) so is your question just like what about what about those kinds of sins yeah yeah well those passages first corinthians 6 galatians 5 or some of those passages where paul lists certain kinds of sins that you know often in those lists he's talking about if you live in these if you practice these so it's more than a one-time occurrence, uh, the kinds of sins he's talking about, sexual morality, greed, mm-hmm. drunkenness, fits of anger, Thievery. those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. What was that? Thievery. Thievery. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Um, believers can sin in those ways. And confession is the way to restore peace and receive forgiveness in those moments. There is a kind of living in those kinds of sin. This is habitual. This is characteristic. This is a pattern that then, yeah, the warning comes. If you keep going down this road, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the 
one way to avoid that is to actually, when if, if you do sin in that way, when you do sin in one of those ways, to confess it in the ways that God tells us to confess our sins. That's actually one of the ways we help to kill our sin. And when we stuff it, when we just kind of, ah, I'm just going to move on, that's a way to entertain sin and help to make it habitual. Mm-hmm. Scott, let's talk about unconfessed sin and how that begins to sabotage both body and soul. Yeah, this just this vivid image in Psalm 32. So he's, David's talking about his sin. He says, when I kept silent, when I kept silent. So there's this, he's not wanting to say it. He knows there's something wrong that he did, but he doesn't want to bring it up. He just wants to move on, try to get past it. But God won't let him. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. He says, day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. So God's hand is upon David. There's there's a heaviness to his conscience. There's an inability to remain free from distraction. Perhaps his sleep is disrupted. He's carrying about with him the knowledge of his sin. And I think anyone who is a believer knows something of that heavy hand where you have said something, you have done something, and maybe you you try to convince yourself in the moment that it wasn't sin. Maybe you know it was sin, but you don't want to stop and actually deal with it with the Lord. You just want to move on, but God won't let you. It stays with you. It presses upon you. And one of the things that this psalm is saying is that that heaviness is a mercy. Mm. It's a mercy from God. It's It's not pleasant at all. But it is God's way of bringing unpleasantness in our conscience and in our heart, a small measure of unpleasantness to save us from great pain, the great pain that would come if we did not bring this to him. And so it's a, it's a reminder of our disrupted communion with him. It's an invitation to come back to him. It's a, it's a pledge. It's a promise that God has not let sin sear our conscience. And so we can come to him. Mm-hmm. Scott Harbert is my guest. I want to read something from the article he wrote about this uh, topic today. It's called, If You Confess How to Bring Your Sins to God. Of course, you can find this at DesiringGod.org. But uh, Scott says, um, um, now I lost it. (laughs) All that work uh, for that much, and there it's all gone. So I'm going to take a break, and when we come back, I'll have it all queued up for you. Scott Hubbard is my guest. Learn more about him at DesiringGod.org. Be right back. Well, I love every day opening God's Word, worshiping Him, studying His Word, and letting it speak to me. If you'd like to sign up for the Verse of the Day email, you can do that at MyFaithRadio.com, and you'll receive a daily Scripture graphic. I encourage you to do it. I'm now back from my midweek mind fog. I found what I was looking for, Scott Hubbard. Here it is. You say this. um, You likely know something of the feeling. A shameful comment escapes your mouth, maybe, or a twisted thought tempts you into a dark place, or a session of scrolling sends you spiraling into jealousy or self-pity. For an hour, a few minutes, even a moment, you turn away from your God. Then guilt rises. But you immediately smother the feeling. No, you say to yourself, that wasn't sin. Or maybe, yes, it was sin, but let's just move on. But you can't move on. Time passes. Conscience presses. Attention fails. Sleep flees. Your hand was heavy upon me. I just love that comment you made, and I just wanted to let everyone hear that. Yeah. Yeah. That is, it doesn't feel, perhaps, like mercy in that moment. But, but it, it is. is. It yeah. Is. That's yeah. really, really powerful. All right, let's go back to uh, naming your sins, because I think this is an important point that you're making, and I want everyone to um, be reminded that let's be specific with God, because he knows every one of our thoughts and actions, so let's just be nice and clear. Yes, that's right. I take, uh, I learn a lot from how David talks about his own sin in this psalm. There's verse 5, is just remarkable. He says, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. I I note first how he repeatedly ascribes the sin to himself. He says, it's mine, mine, mine. Three times in that one verse, he calls his sin, my sin. You know, you remember in the the story where Nathan comes to him after the Bathsheba Mm -hmm. uh, sin, and he says, you know, you are the man. (laughs) It's like David in confession is is going before God and saying, I am the man. 
What, yeah. Whoever else was involved, whatever the extenuating circumstances, this sin is mine. And so I'm not going to make excuses for it. So yeah. that's, He's not throwing anyone else under the camel. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could say bus, but, right. but I mean, let's in put it in context. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, right. that's um, right. Which I love. I love that he's taking full responsibility for his sin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, then, he, and then he names it. Like he actually names it as God does. So he uses these three words for his for his guilt, sin, iniquity, transgression, mm-hmm. which which are not soft words. Oh. Those, those are heavy dealing words. And they remind us that you know they're God's own words for describing our guilt. Right. And we can all we can fall into patterns where we okay, okay, sure, I'll confess whether to God or to another person, but I'm gonna kind of soften it. You know, I I stumbled, I made a mistake, I uh, I, I got I got irritated or something something like that you know soften soften the language instead of using instead of using biblical language I committed sexual immorality I entertained hatred in my heart mm-hmm. I I lied the, those are those are the biblical words for things that we often soften and uh, David is just again he he's a model here his language is blunt it's honest it's unvarnished it's specific and it is true and i think whenever we pull back in either one of those areas where we don't we kind of excuse our sin or we try to soften the language we use for it um our, we're going to we're going to cut off a measure of peace that we might have otherwise that charles spurgeon has this wonderful quote he says when we deal serious we, seriously with our sin god will deal gently with us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so God is ready. He's looking at those who are dealing seriously with their sin, not excusing it, not shirking it, not offering euphemisms. He wants to deal gently with those people. Mm-hmm. And Scott, would you agree? I'm asking for you to agree with something. Is confession agreeing with God? Yeah. Is that sort I, of what it is? Yeah. I've heard other people talk about that. I find that really helpful. Just I in confession, too. we are seeking to agree with God. God says that this sin is worthy of judgment. I agree with you, Lord. God says that this sin is, you know, inexcusable. I agree with you, Lord. Mm-hmm. God says that the only way for this sin to be covered is by the blood of his son. I agree. And so would you forgive me? So it, it, we're just, we're seeking to get, come into alignment with God. Sin has brought us out of alignment. And in confession, what we're doing is we want to agree with him again. Mm. Scott, don't we treat ourselves extra nicely though when it comes to shortcomings and and sin we don't really want to step out and call it sin we want to call it a mistake or i blew it or i think we use words that are not honest yeah yeah i think we do often no yeah. uh that's not everyone's problem but it is a lot of people's yeah. to, um where we're prone to do where we're prone to go and uh again that thinking about agreeing with god and you mentioned it before he already knows everything so i mean Let's not let's not play the game of, you know, trying to dress up our sin to make it look better than it is when we're talking to the one who sees it far more clearly than we do. <laughs> Good like, point. And he's ready to forgive yeah. ev- even the worst of it. Right. So it's not like we have to, con- you know, it's not like if you really saw it, he wouldn't forgive it. No, it's he knows, we know. Now what's required is to agree with him. Yeah. Let's not downplay sin because sin is what uh, brought him to the cross. That's right. Yeah. To forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. This That's is right. a moment of clarity we should be having, not m- muddled kind of confusion. That's right. The cross reminds us that only blood can forgive. And so uh, we can bring things that are worthy of blood. Yeah. So talk about uh, in Psalm 32, David has now confessed and he's ended his stubborn silence. Yes. And I love this. Here's how he puts it after that description of his confession and you forgave the iniquity of my sin it's this kind of simp- beautiful, beautiful straightforward isn't it yeah very simple very straightforward you forgave me just like that the heavy hand that god had put on david is lifted just like that there's no requirement that he do the, you know this long penance there's no probationary period that he puts him on he doesn't say you need to keep feeling feeling awful for another few days. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. So there's this great contrast in the psalm between David, who who waited and waited and kept silent before he confessed, mm-hmm. and God, who immediately upon David's confession, forgives. 
So David waited to confess. God did not wait to forgive. There's a quickness to his forgiveness when we come to him sincerely with that kind of honesty. Mm -hmm. Scott, you are too young to know this, but you'll have to ask your mom um, (laughs) about this and probably your dad, but I know your mom. So the question would be, do you remember the threat of something going on your permanent record when you were in high school? I mean, (laughs) in grade school, there was the threat that Oh, that'll end up on your permanent record. Yeah, I can every, remember something like every that. Every time I heard that, it was like, oh, that's the scariest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> right. You know, and I think there's sometimes we have this translation of, okay, this sin that I have committed, this may be forgiven by God, but certainly not by people. Yeah. And so you, you live with a certain amount of uh, recycled pain and shame and guilt. And yeah. uh, how do we help that person listening right now to say, Can I leave this at the foot of the cross? Yeah. I think that one of the most encouraging descriptions of God's forgiveness in Scripture is that he forgets our sin, which is a wild thing to say about God because you can look into that and like, well, no, he doesn't really forget. Like he's he's omniscient. He knows everything. He can't forget. (laughs) And that's true. But he still phrases it in that way for us. I love that. Hebrews 8, I will not remember their sins. And Psalm, 103, Psalm 103, too. Yeah. I'll be, yeah. And so uh, it's like that image. He's, he's wanting us to know, I don't hold it against you. I wipe the record clean. Mm-hmm. I do not remember this. I don't, I don't hold it, put it on your account. You know, it's uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, this is human love, but it's talking about love is not resentful. That's how the ESV puts it. The NIV translates it more literally. It keeps no record of wrongs. You know, there's no permanent record mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> in the folder of love. Yeah, right. And if that's true for human love, how much more so for God's yeah. own love? Scott, does the enemy have access to those records? He certainly uh, he certainly can know about them. I yeah. mean, he's described as the accuser of the right. brothers. You know, right. day and night he accuses them before our God. So it's not, the, when God forgets our sin, it's not that no one else remembers it. The devil sure remembers it if it's, you know, plain and public and something he can know about. He sure does, and he'll bring it up. So it's not that it won't ever recur to our own minds. But what we do in those moments is come back to the cross, come back to God's own pledges of what he does with our sin, which is so various in Scripture. I mean, not only that he forgets, but that language of forgiveness is like carrying away a burden, lifting something from our backs. He talks about covering it. He, he, he says he refuses, he pledges not to count it against us. He describes himself as our hiding place. He surrounds us with shouts of deliverance. All these are images for people who feel guilty to know what they can expect when they come honestly and repentantly before God. Mm-hmm. Scott Hubbard writes in DesiringGod.org, Confession, in other words, is God's own gift for restoring communion with God. What a beautiful, uh, beautiful thought that this is a gift that God gives us. Yeah. And he alone restores us when we confess. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. And it really is a restoration to him. I, David ends the psalm by saying, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So there's a sweetness to having a clean conscience. There's a sweetness to no longer having the Lord's heavy hand on you. But the sweetest part of that sweetness is having restored fellowship with God himself. Mm-hmm. All right, Scott, if we have something in the brown paper bag for folks to take home, it would be this, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, we will name our sins starkly and thoughtfully and without excuse, and we will receive God's forgiveness. Yes. I'm reading your words, so you better agree. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's like, be sincere, be thoughtful, be honest when you confess, be serious with your sin, Yeah. and then really receive what God says in his word yeah. about what he's done in Christ. And wouldn't the enemy uh, love hidden sin, sins that are, are pushed under the rug and not discussed, not confessed? Isn't that when he can wreak the most amount of havoc in your life? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, he who conceals his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes it will obtain favor, Proverbs. Yeah. So yeah, hidden sin is uh, our, our great, great danger. Mm-hmm. Scott Hubbard's been my guest you go to desiringgod.org, you can find this article. It's uh, from August 20th of this year, and it's called If You Confess, How to Bring Your Sins to God. Thanks, Scott, for being here. Glad to be here, Bill. Really nice. All right, we'll take a little break and be right back. It's the FD. 
And Pastor Dave Ryerson is back in his starring role as guest on the Afternoon with Bill Arnold show. Always glad to have him back. He is the associate pastor at Abiding Savior in Sioux Falls. He's been there since 2021. And I am so looking forward to talking to him today about the importance of Christian community. We all need it. Dave, welcome back. Bill, thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm going to give you guys a quick warning. It's a, a subject I'm kind of passionate about. So if I get a little fiery, uh, don't be afraid to either cut me off or just, you know, turn me down a little bit because it's, uh, it's a pretty uh, great and important topic. Well, I know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Wyatt decide when he wants to cut you off when you get too excited. <laughs> and, you know, that's his call. So I do want to talk about Christian community. It is vitally important. There is so many people suffering with loneliness, mental health issues, and we have a solution, Dave. Mm-hmm. We do have a solution. You know, Bill, here's something interesting. And uh, if I was to tell you what's in, you know, ask you what's in Genesis 1, you'd say, well, the creation account. And what's what's one phrase you hear always described in Genesis 1 in the creation account? Um, in the beginning? In the beginning, yeah. And it is good, right? It Every good. time God makes something, he calls it good. Yes. And as a matter of fact, verses 4... 10, 12, 18, 21, and 25. These are all like a different thing that God speaks and it's created and he calls it good. So you've got all those references there. And then uh, Genesis chapter one even ends and it says, and God saw everything he had made and behold, it was very good. So it's like that, that seal of approval that everything is really good. Well, guess what? The first thing God says is not good. And to give you a clue, it's, it's what we're talking about. He says, it's not good for the man to be alone. Mm-hmm, of course. Yeah. And so in Genesis 2.18, what you have here is God has made Adam and he sees this then and he says, I will make a helper fit for him. But he declares it is not good. So up until this point with creation, everything has been good, but man being alone is not good. And my reason for bringing that up is that this is all the creation account. That means that we're made to be in community with one another. We're not made to be alone. That is so true, and I appreciate this. And I know this is a, a an issue for a lot of people, Dave, that, that find themselves uh, disconnected. And then, of course, you know what happens when you start becoming disconnected. Um, you, your mental health suffers. You get lonely. You realize that you don't have a support system, and that's not what God intended that is correct, Bill. As a matter of fact, I've got some stats here for you um, that I was doing some research recently. And so uh, a 47% of the world's population is age 50 plus. And loneliness is so prevalent in this population group that in 2020, it was deemed a global health priority. Okay, that's a pretty big deal when you've got that many people in it, that this is a priority, we need to address this. And here's why. Here's the symptom or the problem, sorry, that come from chronic loneliness, elevated mortality risk, poor overall health status, higher risk of functional disability, poor cognitive functioning, higher risk of depression, psychiatric distress. And this one's kind of unique. They say actually there's even a decline in hand grip strength for people that are chronically lonely. Wow. And it's, and it's not just an old person problem. It's also, as we would say, well, kids these days, how are they doing with that? This trend, as I was studying this, I found fascinating and frightening, okay? So the trends on loneliness in adolescence since 2012, 2012 was considered the launch of smartphones. So up until the early 2010s, loneliness, depression, and self-harm was actually on a decline in a study of 37 different countries around the world, since 2012, 36 of those countries have seen a drastic spike in the increase of loneliness, depression, and self-harm. What does that tell you right there? Before 2012, actually, with, with kids, it was declining. And then with the introduction of smartphones, you saw a massive spike, which continues to go up in loneliness depression, and self-harm. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was researching this, get a load of this. So on, on my school's library, 
uh, just in the last three years. So I just, I chose peer reviewed journal articles because, you know, we can read any guy out there writing a blog, making up some stuff, right? That's the problem with the internet. So I looked up peer reviewed journal articles in the last three years. And I typed in the word loneliness was the, what these articles were about and 3,466 came up. It is not good for man to be alone. And we're seeing the problems with that now. Wow. Hmm. I do find it interesting, too, as we uh, transition from shaking hands to holding a cell phone. I remember growing up, that was a badge of learning manners as you looked a person in the eye and you shook their hand firmly. Right. And and we're getting away from that. It was actually one of the lessons I, I taught my son. I'm like, look people in the eye. And I was I was pretty adamant about that. But but stop and think about Bill. You mentioned this, you know, as we we get away from understanding social interactions, this is one of the if you were to Google the term maladaptive behavior, uh, the number one example they give for maladaptive behavior is is um would be uh, social anxiety disorder. Okay. Yeah. Well we're People are anxious. So what happens? Well, I get anxious around people, so I pull back from being around people. Well, that's only going to make you more anxious being around people. So the maladaptive behavior is we choose to avoid people because it's an immediate relief of an uncomfortable situation, but that actually creates a greater problem because of all the issues we struggle with by being ourselves. I mean, I, I kind of run up this little fictional scenario, but how many people are having a rough day, you know, mental health wise, I'm not feeling great today. So I'm just going to go home. I'm going to binge out on Netflix and I'm going to order DoorDash because I don't want to have to deal with people. And then if a friend calls to check in, why don't they just text? I don't want to talk to them, right? Like that's all the definition of being alone. But God has said it is not good for man to be alone. Mm. You're starting to sound more like a psychologist, Dave, than than uh, anything else. I mean, this is all making so much sense. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm wrapping up right now. I have uh, just a couple months left, and I'll finish my master's in marriage and family therapy. So it does kind of uh, trigger some of that because this matters as a, as a pastor. You know, who's seeing um, members of the church, both, you know, as a counselor in training, but also as a pastor and people are coming and, and with so many issues and so much of this is centered around struggles in relationships. And, and uh, you know, I, this is one of the most fulfilling things uh, that I've ever done in my life. Bill, have you ever heard of a Georgian, the country Georgia, not the state, a Georgian Supra? No. Okay. Fascinating. My wife calls me up and she was at some event. She goes, look at Georgian Supra. And it was funny. The first website that came up was how to survive a Georgian Supra. And I'm like, what is this? So in, in the country, Georgia, they do these massive feasts. I mean, we're talking table that's overflowing with food. And you have a gentleman that's in charge of the table, the tamada, and you have the melakepe who's in charge of keeping the tamada on check. But the tamada's job, you lead seven different toasts. You'll stand up and you'll give a toast and everybody will cheer and you'll eat and you'll talk. And people are randomly encouraged to give toasts on whatever topic the, the tamada sets for that time. And it's seven different layers of toasting. And this thing goes on for hours. My point is, it's this big table of people just celebrating life together. And I did one with a group of friends from church. And it was so funny, because we sit down to practice doing this. And my first toast was to the Lord. And then so as long as people want to keep sharing, they'll toast, you know, the good things of God and such. Well, right away, we all start diving in and eating and rushing through it. And, and one of uh, the members at our table said, wait, we're being Americans right now. Let's slow down. We're supposed to enjoy this. It was three and a half hours later before we had to wrap up because one of the guy's kids had to go home. Bill, when's the last time you've had a three and a half hour meal with people where nobody was fidgety and wanting to go? It's been it's been a while. It was absolutely so enriching for oh, my bet. soul because we spend time in community and celebrating. We're celebrating God. We're celebrating the good things. We're celebrating one another. And and it might sound intimidating to some people, but you know, even those in the room that were uncomfortable speaking after a while, they realized this is about celebration and they would stand up and give a toast. It's it's a it's a beautiful thing to to read about. It's pretty intimidating. A lot of food. You're you're gonna you need to be rolled out of the room when it's done. <laughs> I'm very intrigued by all this, Dave. I do want to look it up and see the tradition and learn a little bit about it because it sounds like a, a wonderful invitation for a group of friends or family to gather and to and to set the course of a uh Georgian Supra. Did I say that right? 
A Georgian Supra. Georgian yeah, you think Supra. of the country, Georgia, and yeah. a Supra, S-U-P-R-A. Uh, fascinating. There, there's so much written about it, and uh, people laugh about what an experience it is because, it, you know, I think we all, you know, uh, a lot of us had that, you know, those grandparents that grew up on the farm, and so when you'd go visit them, you know, you don't leave the table until you're beyond full. Well, this is kind of one of those. You're just like, oh, I can't eat anymore, and then you still keep eating because you're just socializing and having a great time. Yeah, Dave, the, the Irish have a particular knack for hospitality hospitality and i was invited mm. once when i was over there working to a friend's house and well they weren't friends at the time but but by the time i left they were friends because i was invited for brunch at eleven thirty, and i ended up uh leaving the house at nine forty five that night <laughs> it just it just didn't end and as americans when we're invited to brunch we think of about it think about it as about a two-hour window Oh, that's a lot. I don't know if two hours. I'm usually, you know, fidgety after about an hour, <laughs> hour and a half. Yeah. And, and think about what we're cutting short. We're cutting short the celebration of one another. And and let me be critical to that, Bill. What are we in a rush to go do? I don't know, Dave. Right? Yeah. But we think we are. We're always in a hurry to go. Yeah. 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 I mean, Seinfeld's got a joke about that. He'll say to this crowd, the crowd, okay, you're all out right now, but you can't wait to get back. <laughs> <laughs> There's some truth in there that. There is right? truth in that, we yeah. Go on, yeah. We go on vacation out. and we look forward to getting home. Yeah, you got to uh, get out. And, yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. let's talk about how so, community yeah. keeps us in check. Well, and I think that's the thing. And, and, you know, as I shared initially about the Supra, you know, there, there's both a fulfillment for how we're created to be in community, but that's the, the social stuff. But there's biblical stuff as well, where the Bible teaches about why we're meant to be in, in community and in relationships. And, you know, I for me, there was, a, there was about three different points that really stood out. You could find more in Scripture. Um, I thought the first one was, and as we, because really what's happening in community, we're growing in Christ. It's really hard to grow on our own. And part of it is because we don't really see what's in front of us. A lot of us have maybe not the most accurate description of ourselves. And so we have friends that will warn us. And so the first thing you see in scripture is the constant warning about uh, holding one another accountable. I, you know, I found Titus 1.16. It doesn't address this, but this is the, the word that scared me a little bit. Titus 1.16, Paul writes, they profess to know about God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. But you get that. They profess to know God. How many people would say, well, I'm a Christian, I know God, but the community would say, hey, we don't see you living it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, very interesting, Dave. Yeah. Let me take a short break. Dave Ryerson is my guest. And he is at Abiding Savior Church in Sioux Falls. And we're talking today about how important it is to have Christian community. And we're going to come back and continue our discussion and and give you three good reasons. We already gave you one, why church community is important. And that first one is it keeps us in check. Coming up next when we come back, iron sharpens iron. Welcome is a word said universally all over the world. Every language on the planet has their own way of making a friendly greeting. At Faith Radio, when we welcome, we really mean it. Learn more about us by requesting a free welcome pack gift. Text the word WELCOME to 877-933-2484 or visit MyFaithRadio.com to request your welcome pack today. And a warm welcome to you. Christian community is so important, and my guest Dave uh, Ryerson is very passionate about this, so we are uh, very excited to be talking about the importance of this, and it keeps us in check. So, Dave, let's move on to iron sharpens iron. This is a key, key point. And that is the second point there as well, is that's Proverbs 2017, you know, iron sharpens iron. And it's a phrase maybe some people aren't aware that that's actually a biblical phrase right there, as one man sharpens another. And we do that. We sharpen one another. Um, you know, he said that the spiritual accounting, well, that's one way of sharpening somebody, but that's more like protecting of the church, protecting of of the body of Christ to make sure we're all in check. The iron sharpens iron is just how are we continuing to grow one another 
together. And, you know, I liked it. If you actually read the next verse after that one, whoever tends a fig tree will eat its fruit. And so you get the idea that we will bear fruit as believers, which we're called to do when we are tending to one another, when we're helping one another grow in our in our spiritual faith. I, as a pastor, I think, and I, 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 bet, I bet most pastors out there are going to cringe when they hear this, when a congregation member comes up, hey, I heard this pastor say on YouTube, and we're like, you know, we don't know where it's going to go. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's an absolute hot mess. And I think that's part of our concern is like, what are you hearing out there? The internet is maybe the greatest tool ever for the gospel, and it's probably the worst tool ever for the gospel because there's incredible stuff out there and there's some stuff out there that's really not good. And in community, we help keep one another, hey, that's a little off base or wow, that's really insightful. And we can discuss that and, and really live that out together. And Dave, when the Bereans would meet and examine the scriptures, they didn't go home to their personal Bibles in their personal homes. They met in community and examined the scriptures. See, that's the big key right there, because we do, we, we speak the truth to one another. Because, you know, listen, sometimes it's it's hard to know how to live things out. You know, ethical things can be uh, challenging, and sometimes if the Bible isn't clear, how do I do this best? And somebody might be able to say, like you said there, Bill, is, hey, I've walked this before, I've lived this. You know, when we live in community yeah. and we, we study the Bible, we can encourage one another by saying, I've been there, or I know what this looks like, and it offers such a deeper insight than if we just go home by ourselves because really the only voice that you're hearing is your own voice. Mm -hmm. And Dave, when I think of the image of iron sharpening iron and iron hitting another piece of iron, what I see is sparks sometimes. And Mm -hmm. just as we talk about iron sharpens iron, it's not always comfortable, is it? Uh, no, that's a big thing. And, and you know, especially you go back to the spiritual accountability part. The first one I mentioned, I mean, who's going to say, I can't wait to go to church and be corrected. But the reality <laughs> is, as believers, we should be, you know, I, I'll, I'll let you in a little inside secret. If you ever apply for a job at our church and you're interviewing with me, and I ask that question, you know, tell me your weaknesses. Don't give me the the pat answers. I work too hard or I care too much, right? I want you as a believer to be self-aware, to recognize that sanctification is always a growing process. And so I want people pouring into me. I want to be growing. And we should be able to do that. And, and again, that's going to happen in community. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, but that's why we're encouraged to speak the truth in love. John Maxwell, uh, the great um, um, leadership author, always calls it the the velvet brick. You know, the brick is the truth. And you can't, you know, you got to you got to leave the truth the where it is. But if you hit somebody upside the head with a brick, you're going to kill them. But you wrap it in velvet and it hurts. You get their attention, but you're not trying to kill the individual. You're trying to get their attention. So he calls it the velvet brick where we speak the truth in love. Mm-hmm. I think of uh, Revelation 3 that talks about, I rebuke and punish all whom I love. Mm-hmm. Be in earnest mm-hmm. then and turn from your sins. Yeah, so good. Mm. Uh, Dave, let's talk about uh, how we're created to serve uh, as parts of the body. And because let's just face it, we do need each other. Well, and that's such a great final point there is we are we are needed together. And and there's two ways to to look at the the serving. And of course, there's the the serving within the church. And think about the church you go to, Bill. You were called there. I genuinely believe we all go to the church that we're called to be at. God has said, I want you to be part of this body of believers to build this church up, to serve the community the best that you can. Well, you know, it doesn't happen if we're not really part of that. But you've been gifted to that. How many people just are frustrated? Life doesn't feel fulfilling. I'm not living up to my potential. Because you were created, actually, to serve, you know, maybe not your church specifically, but what I mean by that is you were created by God to build up his kingdom. He has gifted you for that. And your church or your ministry, God's kingdom needs you doing that. So that's one way that it's essential that we serve because, you know, the body and the descriptions in Scripture is so beautiful with body because every part is needed and it's hard for the body to function if not every part is there, especially because sometimes somebody who's not equipped to do something has to fill in for somebody who is equipped who's not doing it. And, you know, that's usually what burns people out. We rarely burn out when we do what we love to do, when we're gifted at something. We burn out when we're stepping in in areas that are harder for us to do, and we know we're not doing as well. And that's that's one of the ways we serve in the church. And I think the other beautiful way is we just serve one another. And now this comes back to that that beautiful community aspect again, because life is hard. Nobody's going to deny that. Life is is challenging. Life's going to throw a lot of hardships at us. 
But doesn't it get a whole lot better when you've got somebody there for you that can come alongside of you, throw an arm around you? How are you doing, friend? What can I do for you, right? Yeah, but how long does it take? If you're called to a church, how long do you think it takes for someone to feel that they not only belong there, but they can trust people who are there? Yeah, oh, that's a two-part answer because you, uh, you you struck a nerve that I, okay. that I have. Um, the first part I think is and I, I've talked to so many people that I left my church because you know I didn't really make any connections. And and one of the challenges that I have for you is I don't want to say you know for if, if you've ever thought that or left a church because of that, but what effort did you make on that? Okay, and I'm not saying you did or didn't, but the, with all relationships, you'll get out of it what you put into it. And so if you just kind of casually greet somebody on a Sunday and expect them to flock around and invite you out, it, it doesn't <laughs> usually work that way. Uh, you know, usually, sometimes it's awkward. And after my sermon, I told my congregation, hey, I'm always available. And a guy came up to me I've never met before and said, I'd love to grab lunch sometime. Great, let's do it. And you could tell he was just looking for community and he was taking a bold step, but that's that's how all of our relationships started. And I have a, a large community at my church now, but I had gone to this church before I got called back as a pastor and it took a couple of years. I mean, these things take a while because we do, we build that kind of trust. But now the second trust you're talking about here, and this is, Bill, I think would be the most beautiful description of a church ever if we all just learned to listen and not talk. What I mean by that is, hey, tell me how are you doing? What's going on? Somebody shares with you. And by not talking, I mean, you don't talk. You just listen and it stays with you and that person because nothing is more damaging to the community. If we're out just blabbing stuff all over the place, if we're violating trust, that's why it's one of the most important things. You know, like I said, I'm studying to be a counselor. You know, why we're under confidentiality rules because you have to know if you come in to see me as a counselor, it's never going to leave this office. And I think it should be the same way in the body of Christ. How much more would we be willing to share with one another our struggles with sin? Because we all have it and it permeates all of us. But how much more willing would we be if we knew a brother or sister in Christ would genuinely hold that in, be praying for you, checking in, how are you doing with that? And it would stay with them. Mm -hmm. Dave, how would you encourage young people to make friends? Now, I'm, I'm trying to cross a bridge here because when you go to church, and I love what you said about that you have to be a participant in connecting to people at church and striking up conversation. I feel sorry for the person that goes into a church for two or three Sundays in a row and then never goes back because they say, no one ever talked to me. And I think, okay, that, that, that's unfortunate, but who did you talk to? That it comes back to that point. And, and I think some of it takes patience. Uh, some of it takes a thick skin. And what I, what I mean by that is, have you ever gone out with some people sometime and it just wasn't a, a spark there? They were pleasant enough, but it's probably not somebody you're going to always do something with. And, yeah. and people might feel that about you too. And so, you know, you can't take that stuff personal. In a sense, it's just you're, you're throwing the line out there and seeing what fish you can really land for relationships. And, and so any young people, and it's, it's a challenge because their world is so online and it's so, I hate to say this, and I'm, I'm, I sound like that old guy screaming at kids to get off my lawn, <laughs> but their, their, their social world is so artificial. Yeah. And research continually reaffirms that that especially adolescents love face-to-face -face interaction because they don't know what to do with it. It's awesome. They love it, but they're not used to it. And how much do we do that where we spend face-to-face -face time? And so I think my point is, is you have to put yourself out there. Be subtle. Don't put unrealistic expectations on other people. Slowly do it. It takes time to build relationships, but keep the end goal in mind how great it feels to be part of a community, because the reality is a church community, to me, again, if God has created us to be together, he's going to make this the place we want to be. I mean, let's be real, all right? There's times we probably do. We look at the world and we're like, I wouldn't mind fitting in, because the world doesn't love us. The scripture is clear about that. Yeah. And we're different from the world. And we're like, well, I want to be like everybody else. But you are. You're in church with the community of people that say, hey, my hope's not in the world. I realize it's empty and it's chasing after nothing. Our hope's in Christ. Let's let's band together around this because we have a world that's hard and it's hard to walk through. How about we walk through this together? There's not a greater feeling than that. Yeah. Dave, thank you so much. It's been just a delight having you back on. I find you uh, inspirational and, and, and encouraging and biblical and wise. So thank you so much for spending time with me today.
Well, thanks, Bill. The next time I have a Supra, why don't you come on out to uh, Sioux Falls, all right? We'll toast you. We'd love to. We will take a short break and be back with more in just a minute. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.